Well, welcome to our live chat on health reform today. You have with you Nancy Ann DeParle. She is the director of the White House Office of Health Reform. We apologize for starting late. Even here in the White House, we occasionally have computer problems, as many of you probably know at home. So we apologize for being here late, but we are here now. And here is Nancy Ann DeParle to take your questions. Thanks. Well, we've just finished a nonstop, really, really busy congressional work period uh, that ended on Friday night. Uh, Congress went home, and they are taking this week in recess, and we are working busily with the congressional staff to get ready for um, markups of the health reform bill when they come back uh, in the Senate and also in the House, and uh, for them to be on the floor with their bills by the end of July, uh, 1st of August, when Congress goes home for the summer recess. So we have a lot to get done in the next uh, four or five weeks. Uh, we made a lot of progress in the last work period. Uh, the House has a discussion draft of a bill uh, that achieves the President's principles, and we're very excited about that. And the Help Committee uh, in the Senate uh, began its markup of our bill. So uh, we're very uh, pleased about the progress we're making towards uh, getting health reform enacted this year. The President has been very clear that health reform can't wait, uh, must not wait, and will not wait another year. And we're pleased to say that that progress is making, is going forward in the House and the Senate towards his goal. So now we're going to take your questions. The way we're going to do this is, uh, I'm Linda Douglas, by the way. I do communications here at the Office of Health Reform. And I will uh, take your questions uh, off of Facebook, and I will ask Nancy Ann the questions. That's how we'll be able to communicate with you. So we'll start off with one from Sue, who says, I am very happy with my home country's health system. I married an American. So this is obviously a question from somebody who's worried about whether the American system will endure. And I would say to her, yes, it will endure. The president has been very clear that our system, uh, our uniquely American system of public-private partnership is the thing he wants to build on. So what we're trying to do is build on the employer-based system here in the United States. And if you have a plan that you like through your employer, and it's working for you, you'll be able to keep it. In fact, the only thing that should change for you is that over time, as our reforms take hold, your costs should come down. Uh, for some of your friends, though, or relatives or neighbors who are maybe in the individual or small group market, work for a small business, or maybe a small business owner themselves, and are having difficulty because of the crushing costs of health care, uh, what the President's plan aims to do is to lower those costs and offer you an affordable alternative through a marketplace or insurance exchange that you can purchase coverage through. So I want to assure you that it will be our uniquely American system that we're building on. Okay, now Daniel asks, he says, I just don't understand why the insurance industry is involved in health care at all. I don't mind doctors and nurses getting paid well. They went to school for a long time and are providing an honorable service to mankind. But why do insurance companies get to make a profit off of their services? I don't get it, he says. Well, uh, he would have a bit of a disagreement, I think, with our first uh, uh, questioner this afternoon who asked, can we preserve what we have? So uh, the insurance system in this country has played a central role in helping to organize the market and get organize providers into networks to get people coverage. And what we're proposing to do is to build on that. So if you have a plan you like, you should be able to keep it. Now what we're also saying though is that the rules of the road for insurance companies have got to change. Uh, for too long, insurance companies have made the profit that you're talking about by cherry picking out the healthy people and by things like pre-existing uh, condition exclusion. So that if someone's been sick, uh, it's very hard for them to go out in the market and buy insurance that they can afford. And I've experienced this in my own family and maybe some of the others who are, who are watching today have as well. So we're going to end all of those things. And that's a, a place where there's bipartisan agreement in the Congress that we need to end those kinds of things. The, the rating rules that mean that young women also often pay more for insurance than young men. Uh, the age discrimination in insurance. All those things we need to reduce and limit and make sure that insurance companies are competing fairly. And I might say that's one reason why the president wants to uh, make sure that there's a public plan option for those people who would like to choose that option in the exchange. So the exchange or marketplace for the people who are uninsured or in the individual and small group market, they'll be able to come into that and look at an array of plans and to make sure that there's choice and competition 
the president wants to be sure there's a public plan option, one that would be sponsored by the government, but would be uh, run on the same rules as the other plans. And that would just offer an element of choice and competition that hasn't been there before. And we think it's a very wise way to proceed here. So uh, Mika asks, uh, I think we should repeal the tax cut that President Bush gave to the top 1% of taxpayers, and we can use that to pay for new health care benefits. So this is one suggestion about paying for the health care benefits. Well, nice suggestion. The President has been clear that health reform will be fully paid for, and the way he's proposed to pay for it is uh, two different sets of things. One is, um, we know there's a lot of waste in the healthcare system today. In fact, the previous question kind of alluded to this, and the health insurance industry has itself said, there's a lot of waste, there's a lot of administrative costs that doesn't need to be there, and that will go away under the new system. So we're proposing to redirect some of those savings that we can get out of, out of reducing waste and inefficiency in the Medicare program towards this new coverage and the new marketplace uh, for everybody. And then in addition, the President has put on the table a revenue option uh, where he would um, equalize the itemized deductions that the most wealthy 2% of taxpayers can take and take them back to the level they were during the Reagan administration. And that would save around $300 billion over the next 10 years. So those two proposal, that, those proposals, plus the Medicare savings through efficiencies, through reducing the premiums that we're paying um, above fee-for-service for the Medicare Advantage HMOs, those things will produce the savings that we need to pay for health reform. So Dwight says, I want to start a business. The number one factor preventing me from doing this is I don't want to lose the insurance that is provided through my employer. What do we say to Dwight? I'd say to Dwight, you wouldn't believe how many times I've heard that story, and the president heard that story all over the country when he was campaigning. Uh, we had a small business forum here at the White House not too long ago, and again, I'd say more than half of the small business owners who came talked about the fact that they just are struggling to continue providing insurance. They're choosing between hiring another person to grow their business or paying for health insurance, and they're struggling to find ways to cut back, and it's, it's clear that the costs of health care are just crushing small businesses. So what we want to do about that is create this insurance exchange or marketplace so that instead of a small business trying to purchase on its own, where if they have one person who had cancer last year, their premiums can be astronomical for the group. Those small businesses can be pooled together, so they purchase insurance with a larger pool, and it should be more affordable for everybody, and that's what we want to get done to help small business owners. So Lori writes, my, hus my hospital charged me $83,000, but the insurance only paid $13,000, and it is paid in full. Why does the hospital charge so much and the insurance pay so little? Wow. <laughs> We've all had that question, if you've ever looked at your explanation of benefits that you get. Well, first of all, Lori, I hope you're feeling better, and I hope the hospital care that you got was good, because that's one of the things we want to focus on as well, is making sure that your, uh, your stays in the hospital, you receive high-quality care. And hospitals have come forward and said they want to work on that, too, so that's the good news. Um, there is a, often a disparity between what the charge is that a hospital shows and what an insurance company pays. And in fact, part of that's because of the leverage. So you must be probably part of a large group. Maybe your employer is a large employer. And the employer was able to negotiate a good rate from the insurance company. And the insurance company was able to negotiate a good rate from the provider because of the volume of business that you were going to provide. So in your case, you had the good news that even though the hospital charge was high, your insurance company had negotiated a payment level so that the payment was much lower. Think, however, if you were in the position of someone who doesn't have insurance, you walk into that same hospital, you needed the care, you got the care, you check out with a bill of $83,000, and there is no discount. There is no insurance covering the $13,000 and saying, okay, you're done. And that's the problem that we're really trying to address here today, is to make sure that, that people who are in that position have an affordable alternative. So Cole writes here, please help me understand the kind of system that's going to be available after health care reform. What options will be available to me? Free health care, low cost health care, medium cost, private options, what is it? These are great questions. I'm really pleased to see that people are, are drilling down and, and 
trying to understand this. So what I would say to you is it depends on where you are now. If you work for a large employer now, and you probably have employer-sponsored insurance already. So I'd say to you, if you like what you have, you're going to be able to keep it. The new reforms that are going to be occurring in Congress won't really affect you at all directly, except that over time, uh, we believe your costs will come down as the reforms that are in these bills take place, like uh, the requirement that everybody have insurance. That's something that is being discussed on Capitol Hill now, is that every, everyone would have a responsibility to purchase some insurance. And when everyone gets covered, that should bring costs down for people who have insurance now, because everybody's paying kind of a hidden tax right now. Some estimates are that it's as much as $1,000 a person if you're insured on behalf of the uninsured. So that's what should happen if you're already covered. If you're already covered and you worry that you might lose your job, which many people do, then the good news about the new system is that um, the, new, the insurance market will be reformed so that if you were to lose your job with a large employer, or let's say you just decided, I'd like to go out and start a business, but maybe you've been afraid to do that as one of our other, um, as one of our other uh, uh, online uh, listeners and participants was. Well, in that case, you could go buy an insurance policy in the exchange, and it would be affordable, unlike the current situation where when you try to go and buy as an individual, it's often unaffordable. And if you've been sick, let's say you work for a large employer right now, but you've had a heart disease or diabetes or some kind of condition in the past, you'd be afraid to leave your job because you'd know that if you tried to go into the individual market or tried to go to a small business, you might have difficulty getting coverage. Well, under the new system, those rules will be reformed so that an insurance company would have to guarantee that they would issue you a policy, they'd have to reduce the amount of medical underwriting, they would have to Quit saying, no, we're not going to cover you because you've had a previous condition or we're going to charge you an astronomical rate. So it should make things better for you if you ever had to leave your large employer. Now, if you're a small business owner or you work for a small business or you're just an individual who wants to purchase insurance, I'd say to you, this reform bill will make a big difference in your life because you'll be able to go into the insurance exchange and it'll be accessible to you in much the same way that we're doing this today. You can go on your laptop call up the exchange and look at the array of policies that are available to you, different prices, and pick a policy that works for you and your family. And it will be less expensive than what you could get now on the small, um, small group market or individual market. And then finally, if you happen to be uninsured, uh, we believe this will really help you because it will, for the first time, enable you to purchase coverage and you'll receive some subsidies or tax credits help from the government to help you uh, purchase the coverage if you're low income. So uh, we believe it'll be a, a tremendous help to people who are uninsured. So Jennifer says she's asked this question twice, and so I didn't see it the first time, but let's ask you now. She says if 75% of every dollar we spend on health care is on chronic illness, and since prevention does not address all chronic illness, what do you hope to do to cut the cost of treating the chronically ill? Well, one thing that cuts the cost of treating the chronically ill is making sure that they get both preventive care, diagnostic care, and you know get in to see their doctor and get on a care regimen. And we know that that works. We've seen that chronic care management of people with diseases like diabetes, for example, which is one of the ones that, it, that costs us the most, makes a big difference. So getting people insurance coverage and having a stable insurance market uh, will help those people a lot, will help them to manage their care, will help them to uh, get control of it. Another thing that we're doing, and I'm glad Jennifer's question gives me a chance to talk about this, uh, because it's one of the first things the President did when he took office, is the Recovery Act contained um, $20 billion, nearly $20 billion to, to be spent in getting uh, health care, the health care industry, up to speed with where many other industries are in information technology, what we're using right now. Uh, the kind of technology that we're using here to communicate with you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people right now, um, can also be used to help manage people's care and keep track of their medications. One of the most important people for chronic illnesses is, are they taking the right medications? Are they taking them at the right times? And healthcare information technology can help with that. So the President signed the Recovery Act, and it had a big investment to 
move us forward and get every American covered with an electronic medical record in the next few years. So that, too, should make a big, a big difference in the lives of people with chronic disease. So there's a follow-up question to that question, which is Deb, who says, but prevention is not as profitable as treatment. What about that? Well, prevention is not as profitable, perhaps, but maybe that's partly because we haven't put enough emphasis on it. And we believe that prevention is a way to save money, and in that way it can help pay for health reform if we really do it right. So we're talking about things like making sure that people get immunizations when they should. That's a part of prevention, getting your flu shot every year and getting the reminder to get your flu shot. So getting people into a stable source of care uh, getting them into you know, what are called medical homes if they happen to be seniors or people with chronic care uh, management or chronic disease problems. That makes a big difference. And uh, prevention you know, is, it can be reimbursed too. And if we, if we incentivize um, doctors and hospitals to really take care of people and keep them well, um, you know, it's just a matter of, of paying them differently. So if we bundle the payment and say we're paying you to keep people well, not just to, to uh, treat them when they become sick, I actually think it can be profitable to them. We just have to reform our payment systems to do that, and that's part of what this bill will do. So several senior citizens, people who are on Medicare, uh, have emailed to say that they're worried that Medicare will be cut under health reform. They've heard that there are savings uh, that will be achieved through Medicare, the Medicare program. How will it affect me, they ask? Well, I'm glad they asked because there's a couple things that will uh, affect them. Uh, the president announced last week one that I hope they've heard about, which is that uh, in uh, working with the pharmaceutical industry to make its contribution to reducing payments uh, as part of health reform, um, the Senate has announced, the Senate Finance Committee, that there will be an arrangement so that the seniors who are in the donut hole right now, that gap in Medicare coverage between around $2,300 and I think $6,700 where there's no coverage right now for prescription drugs. So a senior who has very high drug costs and gets into that donut hall has to pay the whole thing and it's very scary to them. Uh, that will be, will be addressed so that seniors will pay only 50% of the cost of the drugs from the uh, negotiated price. So that'll be a huge help to seniors and that'll be part of health reform. The Medicare reductions that we're talking about are really reductions uh, designed to um, uh, deal with inefficiencies in the system. So here's an example. Right now, there are Medicare HMOs, Medicare Advantage plans, that are paid to uh, provide a, a, a package of benefits to seniors. They're being paid about 14% more than the seniors uh, who get their care through the regular traditional fee-for-service system. So we're going to reduce those payments over time and take out that inefficiency and the additional payment that we're making that really isn't buying anyone better care. So that shouldn't uh, affect a senior at all. Uh, so these, these kinds of reductions shouldn't affect uh, the kind of care that they're getting. Similarly, hospitals receive payments right now that are called disproportionate share payments under the Medicare program. Now that's a fancy word for saying that uh, these payments are designed to compensate hospitals for the cost they have of the bad debt that they incur for caring for uninsured people. So as we cover people though, as people get insurance, over time those bad debt payments should be reduced and so we're proposing to do that. So the reductions in Medicare, the savings in Medicare are those kinds of things and they shouldn't affect the care that Medicare beneficiaries receive at all. In fact, I see some very good things coming out of health reform for seniors. So we've also gotten several questions from people who say, why not single payer? That's a question that I've heard as I've gone around the country. I've been to Burlington, Vermont, and uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, and Des Moines, Iowa, and other places. And almost every place I've gone, there have been a few people who have asked that question. And what I would say to you is this. I think we share the same goal, which is let's get everybody covered in this country. Let's use the resources that we have more wisely and more efficiently. So I think we have the same goal. Um, where we may differ is that I would argue that we should, and I think the president has concluded, we should build on the current system. Why? Because we can make it work better and it's, it can work in a way that we can uh, take care of the people who lack coverage right now and, and build on the strengths of the current system uh, so that we, 
you know, build on the uniquely American public-private system, and we think that's the best way to go. That's less disruptive to the people who have uh, employer-sponsored insurance right now. The 170 million people who are receiving their care that way now won't be disrupted. So we think that's the, the best way to, to go forward. So Bonnie says, please address the issue of a mandate forcing Americans to purchase insurance. She says she's against the mandate, but she also understands that when people go to the emergency room, uh, it, it is expensive for everyone. So what is the answer? Bonnie, you're sorting through the same thing that people here are sorting through. Um, a, a mandate or is a way of saying that it's, the question is, do, do each of us have a responsibility here? to make sure that we're insured. And a lot of people would argue, well, maybe no. And you have some young people who say, no, I don't need insurance. And then those people end up in the emergency room. And as Bonnie's question alludes to, uh, when that happens, Bonnie and I and you, Linda, and all the people who have insurance through our employers and our, and our employers themselves pay a premium. And the recent estimates I've seen are that that can be as much as $1,100 for every family that you're paying to cover the cost of the uninsured people who show up at the emergency room uh, because they haven't you know, taken insurance over time or they haven't bought it. So the issue is, is that really fair? And we believe, the President believes there should be a shared responsibility. Now, now during the campaign, he talked about this a lot and met with a lot of people who had the questions that Bonnie has. And what he said is that he's open to um, an individual responsibility to buy insurance, just like there's an individual responsibility to buy car insurance right now, but uh, only if it's affordable. So we want to make sure that the policy that's out there uh, is affordable to people and that there's a waiver, uh, a hardship waiver. So if you really can't afford it, that you could get a waiver um, from purchasing insurance. But if, under those circumstances, I think it would be fair. And I thank Bonnie for the question because it's a really good one that, that is important to think about. So Mark says, how will the reform in the payment system affect innovation in health care? Well, we hope it will encourage innovation because what we're going to be doing, for example, um, in the Medicare system is we will be um, moving towards more bundled payments. So, uh, for example, right now we find that something like 18 percent of people, Medicare beneficiaries, who get discharged from a hospital come right back again within 30 days. Well, why is that? We want to make sure that we uh, pay the hospital uh, not just for the care that they deliver during the time the person's in the hospital, but also uh, pay them for some of the care afterwards, for 30 days afterwards, so that they're responsible for making sure that the person doesn't just bounce right back into the hospital. We think that should give the hospital the incentive to be innovative in looking at how to care for people better. And we've seen uh, experiments like this in the past have resulted in those kinds of changes in, in uh, payment. We think that changing the way uh, uh, physicians are reimbursed to reimburse them for best, following best practices in, um, to form networks with each other and to really follow best practice practices and to give them the incentives to do that. We think that will encourage them to develop more innovative ways of, of um, caring for people and more efficient ways of caring. So I, I believe there's a lot of promise in those kind of reimbursement reforms. We've had a couple of questions about the cost of malpractice insurance. If we address malpractice insurance costs, will it eliminate costs right away? Well, you know, there's different views about how much malpractice um, concerns really contribute to the cost of health care. I think the most recent study I saw by the General uh, Government Accountability Office projected that it was 2 to 3 percent. Uh, so it's not the big cost driver here. But there's no question that some doctors will tell you that they order more tests uh, because they are afraid of someone looking over their shoulder and that there could be a lawsuit coming. So uh, that's a real concern that they have and uh, we'd like to work together with them to try to address it. Uh, when the President was in Congress, he had a, a bill that he co-sponsored with Senator, then Senator Clinton called the Sorry Works Bill or Medic Bill, and that looked at how to um, incentivize uh, health care providers and clinicians to work with patients and when there have been mistakes to apologize for them, and, it, and there was a mediation that occurred as a result of that. So there's some innovative things out there that we might be able to, to try that would help to alleviate those concerns. 
Uh, so David wants to know, how will incentives for physicians uh, be arranged to keep the patients healthy? What, how does that work? What is the plan for that? Well, physicians right now are paid piecework. So they're paid when you go in when you're sick, and they're really not paid to help keep you healthy. And so David's identified a central problem here. And one of the most gratifying things about uh, the many meetings I've had with clinicians since I came to this job a few months ago is how many of them really get it and really don't want to practice medicine that way anymore. They really want to move towards um, having more incentives to actually keep people well as opposed to just treating them when they're sick. So that's going to involve working together with clinicians and figuring out how to set up uh, what we're calling accountable care organizations. They're places where uh, uh, physicians would practice together in a team and would uh, be reimbursed uh, a bundled payment to really take care of a patient as opposed to just being treated for a disease. Um, it will take some time to get there, but we've seen some promising results from that kind of uh, care model around the country, and that's what we hope to replicate. I'm afraid we only have time just for a couple more here. Uh, we've gotten a couple of questions about folks who say, we have employer-provided insurance, but we want to go with the public plan. Will we be able to do that? Well, uh, right now, we want to be sure that if you like your plan, you can keep it and we want to build on the current employer-based system. So uh, most of the bills being discussed in Congress have provisions in them that say that at least for the first four or five years, no, if you're in an employer-sponsored plan, you don't come into the exchange. The exchange is really meant primarily for people in small businesses and the individual market who don't have access to that kind of purchasing power that you have <coughs> if you work for a large employer. Uh, so that would only be something that will be available over time. You know, some people apparently haven't heard your explanation of the, how the public option would work because we've gotten a lot of questions from folks who feel like they still don't understand what it is. Maybe you could just address that of one course, more time. Of course, of course. So the public option would be one option among many, we hope, that would be available to the people who purchase through the health insurance exchange. So if you think of the exchange as being like a marketplace, and I envision it as being like a website that I could go to, and behind it would be um, a pooling mechanism so that it would gather all the, um, the potential uh, covered people in the area and would, would ask private plans as well as a public option to say, um, Here's, what you, here's the kind of products that you would offer to these people. So you'd go on a website and look at the exchange and see what's offered. And so one of the plans would be a government-sponsored plan, and it would be operating by the same rules as the others. It would have um, a premium and would have a, uh, a product like the others. It would probably have lower administrative costs than most of the other plans. It would be not-for-profit. Um, and it probably wouldn't have the same cost as some of the others in that it wouldn't be uh, since it would be not-for-profit, it wouldn't be needing to make a big profit for shareholders the way some of the plans do now. So I view it as like a lower-cost alternative that would be available uh, for the people who wanted it, and it would be sponsored by the government. We have time for two more questions. One of them is, uh, my uh, fiancé has his, employee, his uh, insurance at his work. He's employed. I do not get insurance through my work. Which one of us will benefit from the plan? So part of it depends on if you have um, insurance at all. I couldn't tell from that question whether she has it. Could you? I couldn't. I think she doesn't have insurance okay. at her, at her and work. So let's assume she gets married to her fiancé, and he has coverage through his employer. Uh, if they have good coverage, which I hope they do, then they'll likely keep that, and that'll be fine. And over time, we believe that the cost for that should come down as the reforms that we're talking about um, to put more emphasis on uh, prevention and chronic care management and those sorts of things take, take place. Um, if she doesn't have coverage and chooses to try to go into the exchange, um, she'll have an affordable option that, where she can purchase, and uh, I hope that'll be a good option for her as well. So maybe she'll have both options. Okay, final question here. Tim has emailed us, I've counted now at least six times, to say, who do I contact 
if I want to express my support for health reform? That's a great question, <laughs> Tim, and I'd urge you and anybody else who's participating today who wants to, to express your support for health reform to go to our website, which is www.healthreform.gov, and on that website, you can, uh, there's a link where you can express your support for health reform. And I think there's also a link on there, as well as on the whitehouse.gov website, uh, to ask the, put some questions on there for the president's online town hall, which is going to be Wednesday. So thank you very much, Nancy and DePaul, for joining us here. And thank all of you out there for all of your questions on Facebook. And I hope you learned something. Uh, so again, www.healthreform.gov is the place to go to get more information. Yes, and we really appreciate your support for health care reform this year. Thank you. Thank you.